Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. ARK Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARK. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARK or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARK to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARK Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to FYI, ARK's weekly podcast on innovation and technology investing. This week is part two of our podcast with Professor Yaakov Nachmias, an Israeli bioengineer and innovator whose technological breakthroughs range from the first 3D printing of human cells to human on chip technologies and the cost effective manufacturing of cultured meat. In this episode, I discuss with Professor Nachmias his startup, Future Meat Technologies, that's been funded by Tyson Foods to develop the next generation of cultured meat. Talk about another company you're working on, Future Meat Technologies. What does Future Meat Technologies do and how did it get started? Let's talk about cultured meat, right? Well, but we'll start earlier. You know, we're what is cultured start... meat? Yeah. I know what cultured meat Almost you... <laughs> 120 years ago, I think. I think it's like almost more than 100 years ago. Erase that from your podcast. It's going to be 100 years ago. So a French scientist named Alexis Carl had this theory that the only reason we age is because of environmental factors. And if you can take an organ out of the human, of the body, and culture it in ideal conditions, it will never die. Wrong theory. <laughs> but he was a Nobel laureate. People were willing to entertain him. You had him. my hopes up for a second. Yeah. <laughs> People were willing to entertain him. And he actually started working together with Lindbergh, right? Charles Lindbergh, the famous mechanical, a mechanical engineer and aviator and the person behind, you know, one of the first heart-lung machines. And he built for him this bioreactor that can maintain a tiny chicken heart outside the body. Now, it turns out that this chicken heart grew and grew and grew and grew and grew, and grew for years in the lab without dying. How do you do that? Well, put it aside, people thought that was really happening. And all of the newspapers around the 1930s were talking about that if they would keep all the pieces from this tiny piece of chicken, they would have a chicken that could cross the Atlantic in a single stride. And we have a quote by Churchill saying how it's illogical to eat animals anymore when you could grow them in the lab. Churchill, Winston. So it turns out that it didn't really work. They were grinding fertilized eggs and adding cells all the time. And that's why the organ was growing. It wasn't really growing like that. And wouldn't the cells be mutating each time it proliferated? They are. It was like a, it was a like free broma growing there. So it was like, a, you know, like a kind of like a tumor or thing. Okay. So that didn't work. But the vision is there and it's pretty old. And then Mark Post had his famous burger in 2013, right? A like burger that cost about $2.3 million per kilogram. And then people got really excited about the possibility of doing it. And I got a call when I was a sabbatical in MIT asking, hey, Kobe, what do you think about it? And I said, well, I think it's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. So that's the benefit of being Israeli. You can say such things. So... And then the, the question is, why? why? Why do we think it's stupid? And I thought it was stupid because it's so expensive to grow cells, right? The basic thing that you need to do to culture cells is to use medium, growth medium. So it's, it's like water, it has amino acids, it has vitamins, it has proteins, hormones. And that doesn't come cheap. It's at least $20 per liter, minimum. And then in my lab, I need at least, you know, between 100 to 1,000 liters to grow kilogram of cells. So bare minimum, we're talking about $200 to $2,000 to grow a kilogram of cells. So you would say, okay, go to these big bioreactors. Don't do it in the lab. You know, go to these massive bioreactors. The problem is that these massive bioreactors, and we have 20-ton liter bioreactors even, the efficiency is not that much better. You know, you get to one kilogram of mass for 10 liters of medium. That's the best you can hope for. So one kilogram for 10 liters. So 
that means that you're at least $200 down the drain. Now, this is weird because if you think about animals like chicken, cows, pigs, humans, for every kilogram of mass that we have, we don't have a liter. We have half a cup of water. We have 100 ml of plasma in our body. How do we do that? It turns out that you know, in the bioreactor, the cells are growing in their own filth, in their own waste. They're producing a lot of ammonia. And that becomes toxic and kills the cells eventually. That's why you have to replace the medium. In our body, the only reason we don't grow in our own filth is because we have a liver, a very active liver that removes the ammonia as urea, and then we, you know, we go to the bathroom and pee it out. So the only reason we have, we can actually maintain ourselves with 100 ml of medium, so half a cup of water, is because we have a very active waste removal system. So the advantage was that I was in sabbatical. So I had a lot of time on the Charles River in the coffee places of Boston. And I was starting to, thinking, to think about those things. And then I said, wait a second, let's you know, build a waste removal system. And that's essentially the IP behind future me technologies. The concept that if we can get cells to grow at industrial scale, while removing the toxins just in the last few days, specifically ammonia, we can actually solve this problem. We can bring the cost down to around 5 to $10 per kilogram if everything else pans out. So we started a company, got the first investment from Tyson Foods, about uh, $2.2 million. Uh, and now, we, now we're moving forward, closing Series A. And it turns out that to get to the point of industrial scale production, we needed to work on completely different type of cells than everybody else. So people like Mark Post were growing muscle cells. Now, you probably know it just as well as I do, but you know, if you want to grow your muscle cells, you go to the gym, not once, not twice, but for several months, and then your muscle mass increases by, what, 10% at best? Because muscles don't like to grow. But every time you get cut, there's another type of cells that grows very, very fast. Those are fibroblasts. They grow on nothing, and they can close the cut in hours. So this is cells of the connective tissue. And if you just focus on them, you can actually get them to grow super fast. They double in about every 20 hours. And we can take them and not only grow them in very high densities, but also turn them into, you know, get them to push them toward fat and push them toward muscle. Because they're somewhere in between fat and muscle. So genetically, we can push them in one direction or push them in the other. And this is essentially the technology we built over the last year and a half. Essentially, getting the right cell types. We have five different lines from chickens, two different li- three different lines for beef. Now we're working on lamb, not pork because we're in Israel, but you know that's doable as well. And getting them to grow at high densities, you know, dramatically lower the cost, and building the system that can drop the cost even lower. So we can get we have chicken skewers and chicken nuggets, and working on a burger, and it's pretty exciting. So I'm curious, I mean, you have normal animals that you, know, you can slaughter and have for meat. Do these meat products, or how do you get it to taste the same? Do they taste the same? Yeah, so, so this is the funny part. When you, think, when, you think, when you say meat, you actually mean muscle. And in muscle, you have two tissues. We have fat, that's like the marbling in the, in the beef, right? It's, it looks white. But it's the same in chicken, it's just both the muscle and the fat are white. So you don't see the differences, but it's the same. So, so there's fat and there is the muscle fibers. Muscle fibers give you the texture and the protein, but what gives you the flavor and the smell is this fat tissue, you know, melting on the grill and doing They release, when, when fat grills, it sizzles, it releases hundreds of polyaromatic hydrocarbons. Very complex molecules, very complex. And these are the molecules that give you the umami flavor. And this is the molecules that you smell every time you go next to a hot dog stand in New York and every time you go to next to one of those shawarma places. This is what we smell. This is what we like. This is what we're addicted to, that fat. So if you want to make a burger that tastes and smells like meat, you actually don't need all the meat. You need the fat. 
you need beef fat, you need chicken fat. The second that you add that, you can change everything. So, you know, products like Beyond or Impassable, right? Even though they're close, if you eat them without the bun and without the cheese and without the ketchup, you will know the difference. You know the difference. It's not exactly meat. It doesn't smell like meat. Okay, it doesn't taste like meat. It's because they don't have the animal fat. Now, if you can add beef fat or chicken fat to them, then you have real chicken and you have fat. You can actually get the best of both worlds, right? You can, get, you can combine plant protein and cultured fat. You will not know the difference. These cells that you choose, you say they can be programmed or encouraged to develop more like muscle fiber and more like fat cells. Is that right? Yeah. So, and so you can. It's, so it's not really reprogramming because all we're doing is differentiation. So it's one transcription factor away. It's a tiny, tiny protein that needs to sit on the DNA and allow them to accumulate fat. So does this mean that the original primary source of these cells are these stem cells no. that you start from? Okay. They're, they're connective tissue cells. They're fibroblasts. So these are the cells that are under the skin. These are the cells in the tendons. It's cells that are everywhere in our body and in an animal body. It's, the, it's what keeps the body together. It's connective tissue. But they are plastic, so they can move in both places. If you eat too much, they'll become fat. If you push them in another direction, they can become muscle. Could you walk me through the economics again? When you were first starting with the bioreactor, it, was, it seemed like it was, it was like a thousand times off in terms of cost. And, and it seemed like a lot of the cost was the input ingredient, the, the amino acid liquid. How does this new approach, where do the variables change such, such that you can bring it down to 5 to $10 per kilo? So you remember that I said that an animal is the ratio between you know, medium and mass in a standard bioreactor is one to 10, right? So medium. 10 liters of mm -hmm. medium for every kilogram of mass in the bioreactor. Mm -hmm. Medium is? Medium is like plasma. It's amino acids, vitamins. And that's uh, stuff we can buy. That's the stuff you buy. Okay. So 10 okay. to 1 reduction. So that's one. Yeah. Yeah. So you need 10 liters for every kilogram. But in an animal, you need, it's that way around. It's two orders of magnitude lower. So you need 100 milliliters, so a tenth of a liter per kilogram. So if your medium it costs $20 per liter, in a standard bioreactor, it will cost you $200 per kilogram. But in an animal, the same amount of feed would be $2. And the equivalent of medium for an animal is just food and water? It's just food. Food and water, that's right. So what we're doing is creating this, you know, you can think about it as a, as a artificial animal, right? Because it has this liver and kidney system inside. And the second that you go from $200 to $2, then that's how you get to 5 to $10 per kilogram. And in your system, in the, in the artificial system, in, in what you're working on at uh, Future Meat Technologies, how does it convert the... Do you just use less medium to begin with and it, it can produce the same amount of mass? Or what is the mechanism there? Yes, you use less medium to begin with. So it can produce the same amount of mass. And you just need to understand that there is a massive amount of waste in a standard bioreactor, right? Because there is waste products. There's a ton of ammonia that accumulates there. You can't use it because it's like the cells are peeing in the water. At some point, you don't want to drink this water anymore. So you need to take them out and replace them with fresh water. If we remove the urine all the time, then we can use the same water. Just trying to visualize the old system. So it's like you put in a, a liter of, of liquid and most of it eventually just turns into ammonia. It sounds like only a tiny fraction becomes food or, mus or, or, or synthetic meat. So a standard process, think about a large vat, right? With a steering mechanism. You put your small amount of cells and a lot of medium. The cells grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And grow. And, and start producing ammonia. At some point, ammonia becomes too toxic for the cells, okay? And then the cells stop growing. The, so if you had a 10-liter tank, you just made one kilogram of mass, okay? Now, in our system, it's the same tank. You put 
10 liters, you put the cells. They grow and 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 produce ammonia. But in our system, we have another instrument right next to the tank that constantly takes the ammonia out, okay, and puts the same water in. So the cells get to one kilogram, two kilogram, four kilogram, and fill the tank. I see. So the ammonia was, is, almost a, is, is acting as a growth inhibitor in the, in the original case. Yes. It's, if you made wine, it's exactly the same thing for yeast, right? The yeast alcohol, right? The yeast grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And when the alcohol level reaches about 10, 12%, the yeast die and you have wine. So you used uh, an interesting terminology, so artificial animals. So there was a huge backlash, and there still is, against GMOs. So I'm just wondering, what do you think the uptake of artificial meat will be? Are they considered GMOs? Or what do you think um, the perception uh, people have right now of synthetically grown meat is? So I don't like to call it artificial meat, and I don't think it's the right term is synthetic meat. I think the right term is cultured meat, both from the concept that we are culturing cells and from the fact that it's much more cultured to grow It sounds grow on meat brand. Like it sounds yeah. very on brand. Very on brand, right. The cultured and, and yogurt. So I think that's the right terminology here. Look, consumers are very conscious and worried about genetic modified food. And I think that's fine. So there are companies in California, for example, that are genetically modifying their cells. And then they make the meat from those cells. So that would be clearly genetically modification, right? You're introducing genes that are not supposed to be there. So people that are used to eat chicken that has been modified with other genes, right? So this could be more artificial. What we're doing is nothing of the sort. We are not modifying the cells. We are actually using a process called spontaneous immortalization. That means, you know, we took cells from an animal once a year ago, and we don't need an animal anymore. It's spontaneously immortalized. We didn't do any genetic modification. There is no foreign genetic material that we introduced. Nothing from bacteria, nothing from viruses, nothing from different organisms. This is, everything is chicken. It's the same cells. We're just growing them. Even when we are turning those cells to fat, it's done with FDA-approved small molecules that are essentially you know, generally regarded as safe. We're adding the right fatty acids and we push them toward the right direction. So there's no genetic modification that happens in everything that we do. So we think that consumer acceptance is going to be the same. But that said, keep in mind that consumers are willing to eat beef where the cows have been fed with GM products, right? So most of the soy in the world and the wheat in the world, you know, is genetically modified. So as long as it's one step removed, consumer would accept it. And number two, I think consumers would accept it if there is no other option. So for example, you know, Fusarium was just identified in Colombia on bananas. So in the next few years, we are done with bananas. That's it. It's monoclonal. We're gone. All the bananas in the world are going to disappear, which Except there are already genetically modified bananas that are resistant to the fungus. So today, you might not be willing to eat genetically modified banana. Five years from now, if the only banana on the supermarket is genetically modified, even if it's labeled as GMO, what are you going to do? Not buy your kids bananas. Oh, you know, Manisha. if it's the only thing on the market, you'll eat it. Yeah, Manisha will absolutely eat the banana. <laughs> she can't she cannot not be eating bananas. I think we're healthy. <laughs> Look, we are addicted to bananas as a species. It's <laughs> and I don't know if you've been to South America and eaten plantains where these bananas actually emerge from. They are disgusting. <laughs> 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 but we're addicted to bananas. You know, my kids are I have four little kids, you know, they are addicted to bananas. I want to go back to, to, to the bioreactor because you mentioned one thing. You mentioned you had an instrument and a device in there that removes the ammonia. That sounds like the secret sauce in everything you're doing, right? One of two secret sauces, I would say. Okay. Yeah. Could you explain what that process is, what it's doing, and what, what makes it special? Probably not in so many words as you would like, simply because some of the IP ha you know, is not not in the public domain and you would like to keep it as Or such. in principle, how does it work? In principle. So in principle... There are very specific resins, so solid particles that can bind 
some molecules and not bind others. This is how, for example, water desalination works. So how your you know, water, water filtration system at, at home works, right? And what we did is essentially add something like a water filtration system for the bioreactor. And it only absorbs some things and keeps the other things in. The problem when you do that is that proteins tend to bind that very, very fast. And, and there are proteins in the medium that you want to keep there, right? So a lot of the, you know, the hormones and the growth factors that you need to grow, you know, the animal, just like a normal animal. So it has to be designed in a way that is very similar to a dialysis circuit, right? Where, you know, the media comes out and then there is, there is no proteins moved to the other side, but the ammonia is absorbed and then it's recirculated back in. So it looks like a column, like a water purification column that you have under the sink, but it's connected to a large bioreactor that looks, you know, if you go to a brewery and see these large vats, that's how it looks like. So the way we envision it to look is that you'll have a mini brewery replacing a barn or a mini brewery like that replacing a chicken coop, right? That's what the word I was looking for, chicken coop. It will just replace that, you know, 1,200 liter units distributed all around the country. And I think the right thing is, is to, you know, have the same farmers that are, you know, growing our food right now move to sell our agriculture. That's exactly the right thing to do because the infrastructure is there and you don't want to, buy, to build these mega factories outside the cities to feed everybody. You want to make sure that the technology is able to be distributed. So how difficult would it be for these farmers to learn how to culture and uh, use these bioreactors? Not very. It's a plug and play operation. So it's kind of like, think about your espresso machine back home. How much do you need to know about uh, espresso machines to use, an es- to use an espresso? Actually, nothing, but you used to, right? I have an espresso machine in the office with these little tiny vo- knobs that I can you know, modify the pressures and the temperatures. But you know, today, it's a plug and play operation. You put a capsule in, you press the button. You can get bioreactors to the same point where it's a plug and play operation, where essentially you're introducing a cell starter culture you press the button and then the mass is grown. That's about it because the feed is well known. The growth cycle is well known. It's exactly the same as, you know, baking bread. Oh, another good example. Today, right now, if you want, you know, bread, a lot of people have bread makers at home. I know we do. You don't need to know anything about baking bread. You know, you have a recipe, you add X, Y, and Z, you press a button, program three, and your bread is ready. It's the same type of design. There's principle, but it's, it's a lot more efficient. You see, our process is start to finish, start to start is about 14 days. So it takes about 10, 12 days for the operation to finish. And then another two days to, to, to prepare and clean for the next batch. That's insane because chickens take about 30 to 60 days to reach maturity. And if you're talking about beef, you're talking about 46 months. That means that farmers today you know, start growing cows, they will sell them 46 months from now. What's going to be the price of beef 46 months from now? Nobody knows. But when you have bioreactors like Future Me Technologies is designing, you can change whatever you're doing with a two weeks time frame. That means you're right before Christmas, so you increase pork production. You're right before, you know, Memorial Day. Everybody wants hamburgers. Let's do hamburgers, right? You want to, the rest of the year, most people eat chicken. You're moving to chicken production. Every two weeks, you can decide what you're going to grow in a bioreactor. It's just a different program. So it allows for a lot better variability in the system. And it can also allow for something else. It's called vertical integration, right? So today... Companies like Tyson are doing an amazing job, you know, completely integrating chicken production. This is why chicken became so cheap. You know, they control the feed. They have farmers grow the chickens for them. They can guarantee a a certain price per animal. They have the meat processing facility, and then they can do the market, right? Completely integrated. And the reason it's completely integrated is because 
farms grow chickens in very high densities. It is impossible to do that for beef and for pork because the animals are too big. They need grazing area. The farms are massive. You can't really integrate it, and you have to think 46 months in advance. But with our technology, you can suddenly vertically integrate whatever you want, right? Because you have the feed, you know the feed, you know the starting cultures, you know but the bioreactors are exactly the same. And you can start switching production very, very fast. So this could dramatically drop the cost of everything. So for chicken, uh, 14 days, for each cycle, how many kilograms of meat are you producing? So... It's not an issue of cycle, it's an issue of bioreactor size. So it's about 80% of the bioreactor volume. So if you have like a, a thousand liter bioreactor system, then we're talking about 800 kilograms, right? Now, if you just focus at producing fat, for example, so if, because that's where the flavor is, right? And then combine it with plant protein, let's say soy protein like Impossible or pea protein like Beyond. Suddenly you can create these hybrid, pro- hybrid products that, are, that smell and have the flavor of meat, the texture of meat, the protein content of meat, only two ingredients. And you only need 20 to 30% of the final product. That means a thousand liter system is going to make 800 kilograms, and then you can multiply that but but that by five, that's about 5,000 kilograms of meat potential, you know, hybrid meat. 5,000 kilograms is about 10 cows. 5,000 kilograms is about 2,000 chickens. You just made that in two weeks. That's that size of a bioreactor system is about two refrigerators big. A refrigerator is about 600 to 800 liters. So two refrigerators. That's the size that you need. Essentially, the size of this room. That's a, that's a, it's a very intriguing thing. And, and I think you just, you just made a huge leap there, which is to say that you're saying the way we're thinking about meat might be, might be too purist, which is meat is meat and, and pea protein is pea is pea and, and, and soy is soy. You're saying if we're really thinking about just in, in terms of uh, flavor and protein content, you really should blend the two. And you only need some amount, of like a fifth of actual meat to, to generate the, I guess, the human gastronomical requirements versus the, the traditional way, which is you need a whole lump of uh, animal. That's right. And keep in mind that we already are doing it in the marketplace today. So a burger that you buy on a store usually has soy protein added to it. You know, turn it around, look at the products. It's not only beef. It's beef and, you know, soy additives. So it's about 8 to 10% to begin with. Pure meat, regular burger, okay? This is not going to be a popular point, but I'm going to make it anyway. This is why I'm a fan of McDonald's. They, they say 100% beef. There's no protein. There's no pea or soy uh, filler there in the Big Mac. This is not sponsored by McDonald's. <laughs> so, you know, McDonald's actually came out in a, in a great hamburger debate in Israel. They, they had this, you know, they did this testing across different burgers. And actually, McDonald's came as one of the top, you know, uh, highest protein content burger out of, you know, some of the biggest chains out there. So, sure. (laughs) (laughs) But most burgers that you buy in a supermarket have some additives in them. So, you know, it's already done. You know, whether, so is that beef? If you add 5, 10%, maybe. You know, then you have Beyond and Impossible that are 100% no beef, right? But now Tyson came with a burger that is 50-50. And I think Purdue came with chicken nuggets that are 50-50. Is that still beef? Maybe. But it's like, but Tyson is saying, instead of eating one Beyond and one regular burger, why don't you eat two of our burgers that are 50-50? You know? Which is, it's not that funny. You want to reduce your impact on the planet? You know? It makes a lot of sense. Not that... A lot of people buying Beyond and Impossible are either vegan, vegetarian, or 20-somethings in New York. But most of the beef in the world is eaten by kids like mine or, you know, people, you know, Midwest United States. They're not going to go and pay, you know, four times more for Beyond Meat. But they still want to have an impact on the planet. They still want to feel good about themselves. 
and they want to reduce their meat production, their, their meat signature and impact. So we need to find to to find some alternatives, and that's one alternative. Essentially, thinking about it as a continuum from 100% animal to 100% plant, there are good ways in the middle, and we think that this hybrid product with cell agriculture and plant protein can be very cost effective and actually cover all the notches, right? So far, we've only really talked about what seems to be ground meat. Now, is there any hope in producing what people are used to as, I guess, direct cuts of meat, pieces of steak, pieces of uh, chicken fillet, where it has this, I don't know, this integrity to it? I think so. There are a couple of technologies coming out. So first of all, there is a shout out to a good friend of mine, Shulamit Levenberg. She has a company called Ale Farms. And they made these very nice pieces of steak that are very, very thin, but they're, they're a steak with vasculature, the blood vessels, and the fat. It's very nice. The problem is the price. When you're trying to make a tissue, a three-dimensional tissue, then the prices are dramatically higher. So if somebody is able to solve those issues of price, then yes, we can definitely make a steak. Maybe how, just there different- are other technologies, though, I would just say that are also very interesting in that regard to make steak-like structures. Could we go through the theoreticals? Because to make ground meat, what I'm envisioning is you, you dump a, a bunch of stuff in a, in a giant vat and you stir and you take out ammonia. That doesn't seem to make steak. So if, if you want to make steak or a rump roast, where do you even begin? So there's a couple of ways to do it. But by the way, that's not exactly what we're doing. No. So I don't know if you saw, you know, it, it, it won't pass well, but here is one of our... I'll show you, take a look at this video, press the button. Actually, you can, you can hear that, right? It's something is frying. <laughs> I can smell something through synesthesia. Yeah. Press it. So this is a extruded soy protein with chicken fat around it. So, you know, it looks on the grill and smells like a chicken, you know, like Tariyaki chicken, which is exactly what it's supposed to smell like. But also when you see the when you see how it looks like in a cross section, you will actually see that it it looks like meat. So, you know, one of those is regular chicken. The other one is ours. Yeah. And then wait a second, that's not it. This is a cross section of it. Yeah. All right. So for yeah. folks who can't see on the podcast, if, imagine a, I guess, a cutlet of chicken with a cross section. You can see the fibers. It's very firm. I can't tell which is which. They, they, they both look like chicken. They both look like chicken. All right. So there is a way to structure protein in a way that will give you the flakiness of, of meat. So chicken we can do. Beef, we're working on it. So there is ways to structure the proteins in such a way to make you know, things that look like a cut of stick. It's going to be more difficult to make, you know, a T-bone with a big bone in the middle. (laughs) It's definitely possible. But that said, would you want to? And this is a good question. Because, you know, if you take a look at the meat market, we are eating burgers, we're eating chicken, right? If we can, this is a huge part of the market. I don't have exact numbers on me right now. I don't remember if it's like 60 or 80%. It's huge. Everything else, including steaks, is a smaller fraction of it. You're saying half, more than half the market is ground? So Maybe in the that, US. But, but chicken pieces as well, by the way. Chicken pieces is not exactly ground meat. You know, chicken, not nuggets, but chicken, you know, strips, which are becoming very, very popular, right? And that's relatively easy to make. So I think that's most of the market, right? Chick-fil-A and burger, five guys for burger and fries. And we, we mentioned McDonald's. We have to have a call out to everybody else there, including Burger King. <laughs> so I think that's, you know, most of the market, this is what we eat. We eat hot dogs, we eat burgers, we eat, we eat you know, chicken strips. And yes, there is a small fraction of steaks. The question is, are we going to eliminate all cows on the planet? That could, I mean, that's the aspiration, I think. Not, not to, not for feed, at Ooh. least. Aspiration of maybe vegans. Oh, sure. Vegetarians, vegetarians vegans. vegans. Yeah. Or yeah. anyone humanitarianly minded. Yeah, but you know, people in Japan eat whale meat, sometimes not because they want to, but because it looks cool. So I doubt that you're going to completely eliminate steak eaters 
You know, there's going to be people that want to eat real animal meat because they want to look cool, because they think it's cool, because they like it. You know, if it becomes a niche market, it's good enough for everybody. Do you see, so, I mean, right now, using the bio, uh, your, uh, the Tyson bioreactors, it's already very cost-effective compared to just rearing cows or chicken uh, on a farm. Do you see th- that cost declining even more with more technological advances? No. Okay. So you've reason- optimized... There's a hard limit. And the hard limit is you have to do the carbon balance, right? So how much sugars, how much protein, how much lipids you need to put into the process. And we are so close to the optimum where there is just no reasonable way to drop the cost further. Okay. And I don't see, you know, soy or, you know, maize or cereal becoming dramatically cheaper over the next decade or so. Actually, I'm I have a feeling that they might even increase in cost because of climate change and, you know, a little bit of uncertainty over, you know, climate and how many harvests we can have from each of those. So, you know, just based on that, you know, the cost is pretty low already, you know, to get to five to $10 per kilogram is really where the optimum lies. It's very difficult to do it. Otherwise, you know, companies like Cargill and Tyson have done their best to drop the costs to their bare minimum. It's decades of evolution, you know, getting to process evolution, you know, getting the right animals, getting the right feed, optimizing the feed to the point where the animal grows super fast. It's just difficult to, you know, you can't really improve on evolution animal evolution, we, we are growing very, very fast and very efficiently. I don't see processes going beyond that. How much technical moat is there in, in this new way of meat production? It seems like manufacturing to, to a degree. It seems like chemi- uh, almost like the petrochemical industry to a degree. It's, it's a lot of adding stuff together and having a, a, an organic process emerge. Are these going to be the future DuPonts or the future TSMCs? What should be the mental kind of imagery of what sort of business this is and how much room is there for multiple players versus consolidation? So there's a beautiful series right now running on History Channel. I don't know if you saw that. It's uh, uh, the foods that make America, I think. I need to look it up. If you can look it up right now, it's addicted to it right now. It's a lot better than, you know, they're aliens. (laughs) But... It's about all of the innovations that emerged after the Civil War that drove, you know, American economy. And when you look at it, you see that every time there was a breakthrough, it was a breakthrough in technology, right? So it's, you know, the McDonald brothers in California, you know, developing the first factory style restaurant, you know, a way to to do processing very, very fast and get two minutes burgers out. The first Heinz factory, it was the first one in, the, in, I think, the world to be electrified to actually use electricity and an assembly line, you know, liquid assembly line going on. You know, it was just as innovative as Ford and it was, it revolutionized the food industry. You know, it was the deep fire of Kentucky Fried Chicken. You know, that was the first technology that emerged. And it's every time there was this innovation in technology that suddenly exploded to the point where it was taken by everybody. And I think this is what we have right now. So we have a lot of different startups working on a bunch of different technologies, and there's going to be a technology that's going to be very, very effective, hopefully, future meat technologies, and that technology can explode and explode very, very fast, and it can take over everything. But I don't think it's going to be a couple of technologies. I think just look, all the other cases, it's going to be one, maybe two and slightly different niches. But that's where it's going, right? This is going to be one that's going to be the most efficient. It's going to take off because efficiency here is the name of the game. You don't have a lot of margins. If this was a high margin industry, then there would be more room for a couple of players. Because this is food and the margins are low, it's usually the first one, you know, the, the, the best technology to take to take off. It's like, you know, electricity. You know, as, as much of DC, you know, versus AC, you know, but the big battle of the time, you know, one is more efficient. There's, there's no, it doesn't matter how much money you pour into it and how nasty you fight, that technology is going to take over. 
Professor Nachmias, thank you so much for coming to talk to us today. Thank you. It's been fun. That's it for this week. You can find the full ARC team on Twitter. We'll catch you next week. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions, and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.